Bobcats. In this video, we're going to take a look at the Bohr model, which was the first modern uh, model of the electrons in an atom uh, that could explain the emission and absorption spectra that had been observed for various elements. Our objectives are to describe the Bohr model and then also show that we can think of the electrons as being arranged in shells. So one way of thinking about the topic of this section is that we're trying to figure out where are the electrons in an atom and uh, why does anybody care about this? Well, if we're looking at the flasks of uh, colored uh, compounds in this slide, that color is due to electron transitions in an atom. And the reason that we care about those electron transitions is that the electrons determine the chemistry of an atom. And by chemistry, I mean all of the compounds that the atom will form, um, what sort of reactions it will undergo. When we know how the electrons are arranged in an atom, we can make all kinds of predictions about its chemical behavior. The Bohr model was proposed around 1913 by the Danish physicist Niels Bohr. He developed his model from looking at various folks' measurements of line spectra for different elements. He proposed the idea that electrons orbit around the nucleus of the atom in certain stable circular orbits, just like a planet um, orbits around the sun. Now, his model fit the experimental data beautifully in terms of all of these line spectra, but it really was contrary to the understanding of charged particles from contemporary physics. Because according to Maxwell's equations, a positive nucleus should attract a negative electron. So when a, an electron and a proton were near each other, um, there, there should be that force of attraction. So why would an electron be stable in a circular orbit? Well, it shouldn't be, according to contemporary physics. It should actually spiral into the nucleus. So Bohr didn't really have an explanation of why these electron orbits could be stable. He just said, hey, look, if we do have stable orbits, we can match this model of the atom to the experimental spectra that have been observed. So this is how Bohr would explain um, the spectra in terms of his model. So at the center of his model, that blue dot at the center of these circles, you have the nucleus. And then all of the circles that are drawn around the nucleus illustrate these stable circular orbits. Now, if you get to be really close to the nucleus, we're talking about a low energy orbit. And as you get further out from the nucleus, we're talking about a high energy orbit. And according to the Bohr model, an electron might jump from one orbit out to another orbit. So that would be going from low energy to high energy. Or it might go in the opposite direction. We might have an electron jump from a higher energy orbit down to a lower energy orbit. Now, roughly speaking, the length of those two arrows that I just drew corresponds to the energy associated with that transition. So if the electron absorbed um, a, a photon of light energy, um, it would jump from the lower energy to the higher energy orbit. If it emitted one, it would go from the higher energy to the lower energy. And the size of that photon in terms of energy um, would be correlated to the length of that arrow or the difference in energy between those stable orbits. So let's look a little bit more closely at absorption. Um, if an atom would absorb light, then an electron would jump from a lower energy orbit 
um, to a higher energy orbit. And so it absorbed that photon of light. So there are a couple possibilities on this atom. It could go from the lowest energy orbit out to the next one. It could go from that middle orbit out to the outer one, or it could go all the way from the lowest energy orbit to the highest energy orbit that's drawn in this diagram. Each one of those arrows is a little bit different length. And so each one of those absorptions would correspond to a different energy of, of the photons that it was absorbing. So when you spread the light out into a spectrum, it, the light would be missing three colors. And so we would see three lines in that absorption spectrum. Um, in terms of day-to-day -day activities, any object that appears colored um, is appearing colored because it absorbed certain colors um, and reflected others. What you see are the reflected colors of light. Uh, the absorbed colors are missing. If we look at emission spectra, the emission spectra are going in the opposite direction. So we might have an electron that's in the outermost energy level, and it drops all the way down to the innermost, lowest energy level. And it also would be possible to go from that outer energy level to the middle one, or to go from the middle one all the way down to the lowest one. And each of those arrows has a slightly different length, which would mean that it would have a slightly different energy because the distance from the, the nucleus tells us what the energy of the orbit is. So we would have, um, in this simplified atom, we would have three lines in our emission spectrum. And since the atom is giving away that energy, it's emitting that light, um, we would see the presence of certain colors. And that's what we're seeing, uh, for instance, in this photograph that shows the neon spectrum. So we'll often see energy level diagrams like this one that are trying to show the actual electron energy levels. As you go higher on this chart, you get to bigger energies. This particular one is showing the um, electron energy levels for the hydrogen atom. Um, the transitions down from higher energy orbits down to the, the energy or down to the orbit that's closest to the nucleus um, all have such high energies that our eyes can't see them. They actually are, exist in the ultraviolet portion of the spectrum. Those are the transitions that are being shown over here. Um, the orbit that's closest to the nucleus is this one down here that's labeled n equals 1. So this guy is closest to the nucleus. And then the second orbit out is this one here. And um, the transitions that end at the second orbit actually fall into the visible portion of the spectrum. Um, we've got a red line, a green line, and a purple line. Um, and you can see these down at the bottom in this uh, diagram of the emission spectrum, where we have a red line, uh, a green line right there, and a purple line. Um, there's a, a second uh, purple line that uh, some people people can see, some people can't. Um, if you, you ever look at this, uh, some people's eyes cut off before um, that second line, uh, but other people can see both of these. This website has some um, interesting um, things that you can do where you can change around the location of the orbits so that you move them to lower energies or higher energies, and you can have the atom absorb an electron or emit an electron, and you can see the corresponding absorption and emission spectra. So take a moment and go over and just kind of experiment with that website, please. So hopefully you found some interesting things in looking at absorption and emission spectra. You saw how the electron would jump from one energy orbit to another energy orbit and how that was translated into the spectra. Uh, just a little bit of vocabulary that I wanted to throw in here with these spectra. Um, if 
all of the electrons in an atom are in the lowest possible energy arrangement, we're going to call that the ground state. Uh, and there is only one possible ground state for an atom. If even one of those electrons has been promoted to a higher energy level, we refer to that situation as being an excited state. And there is literally an infinity of possible excited states um, because there, there are there's an infinite number of energy levels potentially available, and uh, if you have multiple electrons, um, they can be in all sorts of different possible arrangements. So there's only one ground state, but there are many, many, many different excited states. To go into just a little bit more detail on the Bohr model, um, the Bohr model talks about the electrons being arranged in shells. So that orbit that you saw closest to the nucleus would be the first shell. The orbit that's a little bit bigger would be the second shell, and so on. And the different shells can hold different numbers of electrons. The first one can hold two, the second one can hold eight. The sixth shell could hold 72. Um, and somebody who likes playing with numbers noticed this pattern that if we took the shell number and we squared it and then we multiplied that by two, that told us how many electrons could go into that shell. And so that process of squaring the shell number and then multiplying by two is summarized here as 2n squared, where n is the shell number. And I brought that up because that's a relatively simple math formula, right? It's involving multiplication and squaring something. And um, patterns like this tend to fall out of the very complicated um, mathematical descriptions that we have these days for the arrangement of electrons and atoms. When we move on from the Bohr model, we're going to be looking at the quantum model. And the quantum model is really, really, really complicated, but patterns like 2n squared pop up all over the place. And so let's take a look at these three statements about the Bohr model. Two of them are correct, one of them is not correct. The first one says that Bohr's model matched experimental observations of emission spectra observed for atoms. The second one says that Bohr's model explained why electrons are in orbits around atoms. And the third statement is that Bohr's model proposed that electrons are in discrete orbits in atoms. Well, the one of these that is not correct is answer B. Uh, Bohr could not explain why. Um, according to physics, that elect those electrons should spiral into the nucleus instead of being in stable circular orbits around the nucleus. So our first objective was to describe the Bohr model. So it's this idea that electrons orbit uh, in circles around the nucleus. And then to describe the arrangement of electrons in shells, each circular orbit can be referred to as a shell and can hold a different uh, number of electrons. And the, the um, connection there is 2n squared, where n is the number, um, is the, the shell number. 